Hello and welcome to today's live stream. Fantastic to be here today. We've got some really exciting uh, content that we're going to be going through. Mo, hello, welcome. Hey, hey everyone, it's good to be here. I'm uh, Mohammed, and uh, I'm a game designer and I handle game design relations at Machinations. And today we're super excited. We're joined by GD Cuffs and we're going to be deconstructing Game Dev Tycoon. So just wanted to do a quick round of intros. Uh, Lev, why don't you give us a quick introduction? Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks, Machinations, for this live stream and inviting us and for this collaboration. And yeah, basic question, uh, who am I? I'm a game designer who worked on some indie projects as Who is Awesome, I had this game, and Make a Kingdom. Uh, currently, I'm working in mobile game dev industry. It's in Veil Kids, my games. Awesome. Alex, can you give us a brief intro? Yeah, hi, and thank you for inviting us today. Uh, I'm a lead game designer in Setpack Studios uh, in our like, first game replaced. So nice to see you all. Great. Uh, and the Machinations team, obviously. Matthew, can you give us an intro? Hi, Matthew. I'm the evangelist and sales director for Machinations. And alongside me, as always, today, he's going to be doing most of the mod building work, is this amazing guy here, Cesar. Say hi, Cesar, and introduce yourself. Hello, I am Cesar. I am a Machinations Diagram craftsman for the team. For any of you that have been watching our live streams regularly, you probably recognize me and Matthew and Mo. Uh, yeah, I'll be doing most of the building today. So hopefully, we can get uh, something to a nice model by the end of it. Right. So this is really interesting because, you know, I've been talking to the folks at GD Cuffs for a, a couple of weeks and uh, we were talking about, you know, doing a collaboration, what game we'd like to, to deconstruct live and talk game design. And uh, Lev was talking about Game Dev Tycoon and thinking that would be a great deconstruction to do. And I, I wholeheartedly agree. So actually what I would like to do is, is hand over to you, Lev, to lead the discussion. Okay, thank you for this opportunity. And I would like to add one thing probably the missed, what is GDKFs? What, who are the game design scuffs? Probably it's like the biggest CIS community of game designers who share their exper uh, expertise and make some posts, blogs, and other stuff. So yeah, the discussion. Probably the basic question about tycoons what is a tycoon game? What is about? And if they look at the definition of a vote, they'll find that a tycoon is a prominent figure in a particular industry who has amassed substantial wealth and power while building a business empire. And tycoons are often in the fight in industries that have economic prominence. So two key votes in this definition probably are economic and empire. And these two votes are the basic of every Tycoon game, you have to build an empire, which is focused probably on the economy, and you have to earn, earn money in order to earn more money. And as a player, you start with a small amount of money, but then earn and earn more. So from these uh, definitions, we can say what a lot of tycoons have in common. The first one, uh, the first thing, it's a main one probably main resource, which is often, but uh, not necessarily money. And every economic flow and everything in game will be focused on it. Secondly, the game will be about a, part about a particular industry. For example, about a restaurant business or about, uh, I don't know, maybe graveyard, like uh, graveyard keeper. And um, thirdly, Returning to resources, we mustn't forget about another important thing is time. Probably in every Tycoon game, we can say that money is a function which depends on how much time you spend in the game. And coming to conclusion, I would like to say that if we would like to um, group tycoon games simulations and strategy games because they have a thin border between these genres we can say when if you play as a man who develops the games you play a simulator if you play 
uh, a company who develops a game, probably it's going to be a tycoon. And when you play as a big, big empire of uh, companies who are creating games and who probably um, make some wars between different companies, it's going to be a strategy. I do like this um, um, comparison in order to define the borders of genres. Yeah, this is it. Great. I, I think that was a very descriptive launching point. And, uh, you know, what I wanted to sort of talk about, Cesar, is where do we go from here? You know, where, where do we kick off with this deconstruction? Yes. Uh, I have played games with Tycoon before. I do know the game. Uh, there are certain parameters that are important in the game. Um, the game is pretty, I would say, a, a very good fit for machinations because a lot of its systems are based on formulas and math. Um, but uh, I would probably let uh, Lev talk about the different systems that the game has. And while, they talk, while he talks about the systems, I can then come and model that particular system in machinations and show. Uh, my first thought is we start with time because time is basically a very important resource alongside money. So time and money are probably the most important resources in the game. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with Cesar because no, <laughs> if I previously said that all tycoons are focused on earning money, which can be uh, converted into time. And if you see that uh, in Game Dev Tycoon, we probably have one big pool of time and three uh, small pools like weeks, months, and years, but all they can be converted into real time. And uh, so, yeah, this is what we start from. Alex, maybe you have something to add? Uh, well, in terms of uh, a game of Tycoon, it's a, a very systematic game. So we can see it as like basically all mechanics in the game focus on increasing player like uh, currency flow, increase of play, player currency flow. So it can be very easily, uh, you know, uh, imagined as a system. And it basically every system in uh, every like, parameters in Game of Tycoon is easily seen when you play it. You see you know, like a little bubbles that's like go to design points to, uh, uh, to design or, or in technology. So it's very, very easy to understand how it works actually. Uh, Moro, probably the thing is that mostly of all the game of all tycoons are games about maths. Just like you want to find this uh, the maximum of a function that is in core loop. So you're trying to maximize your income and decrease the uh, outcome of your monies. Yeah, I guess our first step then should be time, um, just to show how time is represented. Uh, time in the game is represented in <clears throat> weeks, months, and years. Uh, it's a pretty systematic approach where four weeks, uh, a month has four weeks, uh, a year has 12 months. Uh, there's no concept of, us, of days, so we don't have days, only, only weeks, months, and years. Um, the year factor is pretty important because it, it uh, comes into, it returns into some of the, the formulas that um, <clears throat> calculate the, the, the score that a, a game will have. So the year is pretty, pretty important. Months and weeks are important because um, they uh, generate, they are used to, to, to symbolize time and you will see that when a game is completed and it starts generating revenue, it generates weekly revenue. So, and that revenue decreases over time. So weeks and months are important in that aspect because a newly released game will generate uh, some income and then gradually decrease over time, depending on the quality of the game and uh, the number of fans that uh, the, the company has. Now, this is what uh, Matthew built on the screen. It's a, it's a simple mechanism where um, four weeks turn into a month and 12 months uh, turn into a year. Uh, I personally want to add a, an extra thing here. 
uh, currently the way we have it. No, no, leave it as it is, it's fine. Oh, yeah, okay, you're adding it. Um, the construction that Matthew had before, where you can see that 12 months would convert into, into one year, would mean that as soon as the player reaches the 12th month, December, those uh, months would convert into a, a year. So we would basically skip the month of December and start from a month of zero, which is something that does not really exist. Uh, by doing a construction like this, which in which we split two resources, um, we actually uh, use the month of December, so to speak, to turn it into January. So we add an extra year in there, but we keep the months in. Uh, now Matthew shows you what happens when we start from from uh, uh, November. He set the um, display uh, property of the pool to zero. You can see that now we start from January and our year has passed. So this is something to avoid starting from a month of zero that does not exist. Uh, also, Matthew, I would change the uh, 12 before the converter into a 13, so we actually play the month of December. Yeah, and this way, now we're in November. When the four weeks pass, we're going to be in December. And when the four weeks of December pass, we're going to go back to January next year, so something like this. Uh, this is going to be what we use for time. As I said, the final pool year is going to be used for, for some different things. Uh, but as, at the moment, we're going to leave it as it is. Uh, this is this is how time flows in the game. We also have money. Uh, the player uses money for hiring staff, uh, developing games. All, all types of games have a, a cost, depending on how much you want to invest in a game. Um, the quality will increase. Uh, but at the moment, we will just represent the money as a pool uh, where we're going to store them as resources. Going to set the display to minus one. Uh, just going to name it cash or something. And one condition that we have in here is that if the player somehow gets to below ten thousand um, dollars, the game is declared as a as a loss and it's basically game over for the player. So I am put uh, Matthew named the end condition to game failed and I will uh, change the condition to lower than 10,000. So whenever we have the, ca the cash lower than 10,000, the game will end. Now the player has a, a starting sum of, uh, of money, which is 70,000. So we're gonna set the initial resources in the pool here to 70K. Uh, we don't really have, uh, because we don't have the rest of the model build, we don't really spend money at the moment. We're gonna come back to this later, but this is basically how you keep track of how much money you have and uh, when the game fails. Excellent. Yeah. So what's the, the next kind of core, um, core mechanic that we need to think about? Maybe we should add substantial resources like uh, research points and, uh, after this, we can start uh, constructing the call loop of a game, I guess. Perfect. So I'll add in these pools so we're ready. Yes. Uh, building a game is a series of steps where the player chooses different, um, different parameters. They choose the genre. They choose the platform on which to develop the game. Uh, they choose the intended audience, the target audience. So there's uh, several different factors that the player gets to choose. And um, those choices affect the outcome because some of the choices match better to, uh, with others. So for instance, if you, if you develop a horror game for kids, it's not going to have uh, a great success because kids don't really like horror games. But if you de develop horror games for a mature audience, it's going to have way better success uh, because the combination is uh, more successful. Um, the, the, I guess the next part would be to uh, look at selecting the different options that the player has for all of the, the, the mentioned uh, criteria. And uh, we have those, we have topic, uh, 
which can be one of six. So Matthew, I don't know if you want me to build it or you build it. Uh, okay, just yeah, a, I'll start it off. Okay, uh, just a, a random gate with six possible outcomes. I think that we should make the source uh, interactive just so that we can show and we decide when we want to build what we want to build. Uh, so we have six topics. The topics are abstract, dance, dungeon, horror, sci-fi, and zombies. Uh, those are starting ones. You can research more as the game progresses, but we will just stick to the, the starting ones. And uh, we also have, uh, after Matthew finishes the construction, let me also help him with some connections here. Um, I can just uh, copy it and replicate it a bit below because we also have six genres. So it's easy to replicate uh, because there's six options there as well. Uh, we can name the, the source on the top. We can name it uh, choose topic. We can name the second source choose genre. And uh, Matthew is going and uh, giving them all uh, their respective uh, names. Now, just because, just to show uh, while we're on topic and genre, what I talked about, which is selecting different combinations of, of these, um, of these uh, parameters, they will give you a coefficient that will go into the final score of the game. So the way we're gonna handle that in machinations is uh, basically you can look at this as a six by six matrix that gives different uh, different outputs. Uh, the way we're going to treat it in machinations is we're going to use a register and uh, we're going to send. So whenever a player is going to choose a topic, that means that one resource will go into that specific pool. So uh, we're just going to send information from the pool using state connections. And uh, from each individual pool, we're going to send it into, into the register in the middle. Now, uh, this is up to everyone and how they build they, their models. I usually like to name my variables in a way that kind of helps me when I'm using them, especially if I'm using many of them. So because the, the one on top is called topic, I'm just, I'll just name them uh, starting with T and give them numbers like T1, T2, and so on, uh, just to know which topic they are. And uh, the ones at the bottom, because the genre, they're going to be Gs, so G1, G2, and so on. Uh, while Matthew is drawing the connections uh, for the bottom one, um, the idea here is that we have to look at the, the different uh, inputs and see what the player has selected. Now, this part is a bit uh, tricky because we use MathJS in registers. That means that um, the part of, of this formula, we, we aren't really able to use mat matrices. So we usually do just like a search of conditions. Now the formula is quite large. Uh, I admit that I have prepared it beforehand just to, to show, just, just so I don't have to type for 10 minutes on, on stream. That would be pretty boring for everyone. So if you have a look at the register now, I'm just going to paste it in and hit enter and you're going to see something nice appear on the screen. There we go. So this is kind of what uh, a lot of it is copy paste. So trust me when I say it's not as bad as it looks because a lot of it is copy paste. But um, if the text bothers us, we can just go to the properties and make it smaller. Um, the formula is basically just checking which pools contain resources, that's it. And if uh, we were to hit play right now, Matthew, we can, let's just see how it looks like when we choose a topic and a genre, and uh, we can see what is the coefficient that we get for them. So we got adventure as a topic and we get dungeon, adventure and dungeon, apparently a bad combination, we only get 0.6. So, uh, not the best one, but again, if we reset, try a different one, it's probably going to be a different outcome. So 
zombie is a casual, that's a one. So that's a good combination for us. So yeah. There's the coefficient can go as high as one. So one is the highest, is the best one. And it can go as low as 0 0.6. So that's the lowest one. That's the worst combination. That so. Uh, so just um, so here I've got G two and T four. Let's have a look just to understand what's happening in this giant formula here. So here you've got uh, G two, uh, G two, and then T four. So G two. Uh, T4 and G2. So here you've got um, greater than zero T4, which it is, and G2 greater than zero, which it is. Those two are then multiplied together. And then all of those are then multiplied by one. So this kind of this first section of it, everything, all of these combinations multiplied by one, give an output of one. All of these combinations uh, are then multiplied by 0 0.6. So those combinations give a 0 0.6. So that's really how you've um, built that up to show the different combinations. So although it looks really complicated, it's like all the combinations that equal one are there, all the combinations that equal a different result are there. Is that correct? Yes, it is. I am looking at, uh, it could have been done maybe in an easier way to understand but it would have been more writing but yeah i'm essentially taking all of the combinations that would give one and group them together all of the combinations that have 0.9 and so on and group them together yeah nice um, because this is a six by six matrix essentially this is going to be the largest one that we have uh the rest of the choices are less um less uh offering so to say because platforms we only have two in the beginning so audience we only have three so it uh, decreases the number of checks that we have to do significantly um and if we're on the topic of platforms matthew maybe we can uh integrate those as well there's only two of them only pc and Governor 64 if i read that correctly i i think i'm a bit too young for this one um thanks Chesa. thanks <laughs> Oh, you know it? Oh my gosh, <laughs> you're even older than I thought. Uh, and uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, those two platforms are the only options that you have in the beginning of the game. Again, they correlate. Um, it's important when choosing a, a platform. It uh, it's important to the genre that you choose because some genres are better suited for certain platforms. So, for instance, uh, a casual game that's built on PC will have a 0.6 coefficient, but a casual game that's built on the Govador will have a 0.7. So it's better to not build them on PC. Uh, later in the game, several new platforms are introduced. I think the platforms are uh, the ones that switch over a lot, if not the most, uh, given that time passes, new and new platforms are introduced. So the player is quickly, uh, some of the platforms are out of market over time so the governor is pretty quickly going out of market in the beginning of the game so any games that you launch there will quickly lose value so uh, it, it's always best for the player to try to adapt to the new platforms and uh, to the, the the audience um matthew is also building the target audience there we only have three options here which are young uh, everyone and mature uh, again those correlate with the genre because again some games are better suited for certain uh, audience age. Now, for having the other coefficients, again, we're going to use a similar register. Again, we're going to have to send the values in. Um, so I'm just going to place another one here, which is for the platform. The platform looks at the genre. So uh, again, I'm going to be using the genres from the top. I'll try to keep my connection nice and tidy. Um, so uh, it doesn't take a lot of space in the model. You are going to see that by overlapping them, I can save some space and uh, it won't look as ugly. And uh, while I do that and name them, Matthew, if you can uh, come with some connections from the platforms, with the two connections from the platforms. 
and go into the same register. Sorry for interrupting. I just would like to add that we decided to simplify the simulation in some way. And in real game, in Game Dev Tycoon, a player has to unlock the choosing of of um, of a target audience, but we decided not to do it and to simplify the model. And one more thing that every player has a random uh, pool of topics which are unlocked by the start. So someone has a better start than another player. <laughs> and this is the moment when you understand that game and uh, that tycoons are all about maps because this is like the probably the first minute of the game <laughs> and you already have several magic coefficients. Nice. So how many different um, kind of genres would you have unlocked at the start? No, 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 it's, it's okay. We simplified the model. So we, we just say that uh, only, six, only six are opened, but in the game, the player has like maybe 60 more to unlock. Oh, okay. They sense. unlock they unlock over time anyway a lot of yeah, time. yeah. So, yeah and... you spend your research point on unlocking new topics but uh, at the start it's always six random topics yeah uh, when you complete a game you learn stuff from building the game so to speak so you get some points that you can then invest in unlocking new games technologies so yeah. which goes into our previous points research yeah. points sorry yes. Makes sense. So Chisel, you got another one of your amazing uh, amazing formulas here. Yes. So all of the results that, uh, all the combinations that result in a one and all the results that result, or combinations that result in a 0 0.6. So now if I... Matthew, I'm, I'm getting that your, your mic is a bit low, if you can turn yourself up a bit. Oh, I will try. There we go. Hopefully that should be a little bit better. Okay. Uh, yeah, if you said that we don't need target audience, then I would not bother combining these as well. We can leave it on the bottom there just to show that there, you can choose between the three. And uh, uh, yeah, we can I, move on. I don't know. Maybe it's it's if it's not a hard to... Uh, to connect with things, maybe it's better to connect. Okay, um, it's not probably. Oh. It's not because I have the formula written oh, okay. you know, <laughs> in advance. <laughs> I didn't want to do so. Yeah, we we do have to drag the connections. Matthew audience is um, combined with topic, so uh, not with genre. So we have to drag them from the top. Yeah. These these connections. No, the one at the top, topic. Oh, topics down into this yeah. register. No, we put a new one for the target audience with the young, everyone and mature. Okay. And uh, I'll drag them from the top. You drag them from the bottom from the, the audience age. Okay. I'll name them. Uh, disclaimer, there is because I written these formulas but didn't really review them thoroughly there is a chance that i have some of them mixed up so if uh, you guys see any values that are not in uh, accordance to the game uh, pretend that you didn't see them <laughs> <laughs> as really? long as they don't they don't add above one they don't add up above one we should be fine so uh, i'm i'm hoping that's the case I uh, just got two more connections to, to put in. I'll paste the formula, then, and then we can move on to the next stage. Which next stage means more formulas for us. Um, okay. It's just, uh, oh, perfect. When you're going through a deconstruction, looking at things, being able to kind of work out what are the key variables and what's the key metrics that are used to kind of build up the game logic. This is ideal because we're now able to kind of see where we're um, 
where the, the kind of the different variables are and what the output is and then that in the next step i guess that allows us to see what impact this has on the game yeah you can you can build a game from scratch now choosing a topic a platform and a target audience and uh, let's see just what are the multipliers that we're getting so so here we're getting 0 0.9 0 0.9 and 0 0.9 yeah decent it's pretty decent um certainly on the higher side and we're building a what a pc game for young audience oh, we're oh sorry. One. it's fine yeah, by the way the one on the bottom the one on the bottom is deterministic just saying uh it's a deterministic oh. gate so it's always gonna shoot the first one into young well spotted so we've got a mature audience it's on the pc it's an abstract game on adventure Reminds me of our random spin wheel that we use for some of our live streams. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, adventure and abstract, as you see, is not a very good combination, only 0.7. Uh, for the other ones, 0.9 and 0.8, I would say that this is on the lower side, so not a very good, um, not a very good combination for our player. But you do learn these over time, so uh, there is the aspect of improving yourself at the game. The more you build, the more you know which genre caters to which people, to which platform, to which, you know, the combinations in general. So, uh, yeah, I think we can take it to the next step. Um, this is basically what the player has to decide when building a game. Um, so this is the first step of building a game. Uh, next up, I think we're going to touch on how to do the math on the score that the game gets am i right mm, probably from my point of view in some way it's better to make this step like of a uh, real tycoon game when the player chooses what to focus on uh how much uh game design and tech points he have or she and how they convince into the quality of the game but uh, I don't yes. know, <laughs> you are a master of the diagrams, so <laughs> you it's, choose what to do. What it's, to do. A, it's, a, it's a combined effort here. Um, I'm thinking of uh, the, um, the points. Uh, we have a number of, of, so when the player builds a game, they generate points. Uh, and while they're building the game, they keep generating them. They also generate some bugs. Uh, and when the product is finished based on the, those points that they generated, uh, they get their um, um, scores. Now, the points that they generate, there's more factors to it. But basically, they have some points. Those points increase over time, if I got that correctly. So we call the, the total number of points that they have general points. And those with completed games increase because the player, the developers get more experience, technically. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah if I got it correctly, the, we should start our uh, model from having 21 general points. And uh, every three games that the player releases, they get three more general points. Uh, we can have that as a pool, Matthew, just one pool called general points that starts off with uh, 21. And when the player uses those general points while developing, those are split uh, into two different pools, which are design points and technology points. So, but the total has to amount to the general points. So if you have 21, you're, you have the possibility of having 10 design and 11 technology. You have the possibility to have nine design and 12 technology, but the points are usually split up very close because the formula is is random but it keeps the number close to the the average of total points so if the average of total points is 10.5 you're looking at between 9 and 12 points in each category basically so it's not uh, so far from each other now uh it's good that you place those registers there ahead of time uh as i said we're going to have both design points and technology points uh if we have the formula for one the other one is easy to to deduce because we just uh, deduct it from the general points in there uh, i'm going to name the first register design points 
while Matthew is dragging the, the connections around and I'm going to name the second one technology points. Now the formula for this is using a random approach. Uh, I'm just going to type a formula in here. Uh, I'm going to explain what it does after that. We look at the general points, we split them in half, and it can be between uh, somewhere close to it, but below to somewhere above. And uh, while I type it, I'm also gonna mention one other thing uh, here. So if Matthew, if you would zoom in on the formula, okay, we have GP is the general point, that's what we're gonna name the variable coming in. So instead of A, yeah. Matthew is going to change it to capital GP. Uh, the formula in there, and um, I typed it with a plus two at the end. So it's basically general point divided by two minus one, general points divided by two plus two. Now the formula is plus one, but random int uh, does not include the final value that is uh, in the in the list of values that you give it. So in order to get that to be able to get that final value, I listed it as plus two, so it can reach that plus one. Uh, it will never reach plus two, so it's fine. And uh, the technology points, because we have the design points, that's the, the easier one to do. We have A and B, I'm just gonna leave them as, as A and B, and we're gonna do A minus B. So basically the total points minus the design points. So yeah, and if we have uh, 21 general points instead of three, we, split them up when the game uh, is developed. I've done some testing on my part with this. You cannot have a gap more than 12 and 9. So it's not never going to be 13 and 8 in this case, for instance. You can go 10, 11, or 12 and 9 in some directions. And uh, these are important because they um, influence the score, they influence the quality, they influence a, a bunch of different factors, to which we're going to go in. Uh, this is something that should occur whenever you start to build, uh, when you choose your four topics, that is when we should uh, calculate those design points and technology points. Uh, is there anything I, this is pretty correct, right, so far? Yeah, 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 probably I just like would just say that we are designing diagram this way because we're designing the games from scratch and we decided again to simplify this model in some way, not to simulate the real uh, team system, which is on the game. Because if we would like to uh, simulate it, these formulas will be much, much bigger. Because it depends on your team experience, on who are on your team, like more technical people or more people which are about game design. So it's just like a expression for the beginning when the player has only one man in his in their team and they develop the, the games and after the game is created this only man uh, woman gets the experience from the creation of a game and they're balanced between uh, technical side and game design yeah this is it yes uh, yes good mention the game you basically start as a solo dev in your basement <laughs> And you go up from there to having your own company and having a lot of employees. And of course, having more employees will influence the outcome of games and the, all of the points that you get and all of the, the score that you get. But um, obviously, we're just for simplifying the model, we're just looking at the beginning of the game where you, when you're a solo dev and uh, you just have those points on your own. Uh, OK, we also have some bugs in here. Um, now the bugs, as I understand, are generated pretty randomly. Uh, the idea in the game is that as you develop the game, you alongside sending points into design points and technology points, um, you also generate bugs. And you can generate up to six bugs. And uh, when you're finished developing the game, there you have the option to launch the game as it is or spend additional time on fixing the bugs. And if you choose to spend additional time, the number of bugs slowly decreases over time until it reaches zero. If you are patient until that point, you can launch the game in that manner and um, uh, it will be bug free. If you don't have the patience and you need the money now, you can launch it with a couple of bugs. It will probably affect some of your score, 
but if you think that it's a very solid gain, you can take the risk and uh, it will still probably pay off. I personally always waited until I finished resolving all of my bugs, but uh, I guess it is possible to, to launch it with bugs and maybe they don't affect the game as much as I think. Um, yeah, the way Matthew built it is basically generating uh, between three, three and six resources. Um, you can see on the connection, we have a two plus D4. The D4 symbolizes a dice with four faces. So it can, it will roll on every step and uh, the result can be between one and four. And because we have a flat two in there, we add one and between one and four to two, it's gonna be between three and six. So this is the number of bugs that we're gonna generate when uh, building a project. Only was that uh, low in real game design. Yeah, I know. But it is, to be fair, it's, those are games that are made by a single dev and they're not very big games. So smaller games don't have that many bugs. So uh, it's probably Fingers fair. Crossed. Yeah. Uh, when you're a large company and you have like, I don't know, not large company, but when you have like 10 employees and building giant games, you're going to see that you're going to be generating a lot of bugs. Uh, so, but you also fix them faster because you have more, more people working on them. So, yeah. Also, um, if I remember correctly, uh, when you fix bugs, you can convert them randomly uh, into research points, design points, and technology points sometimes. Okay. Uh, is there a condition for that or is it just random? I don't know. I think it's a kind of like it's a it's a kind of random. So I don't know exact formula okay. because it looks like it's random. Okay. When uh, you have yeah, when you have more bugs, it starts to be like very noticeable when you start to fix it. Okay, and uh, there is a chance that you turn them into design technology or research, but there is a chance that you don't turn them into anything. Like they just disappear, and that's it. Yeah. yeah, the chance is pretty low, actually. So. Okay. Okay, Matthew's already on it, as I see. Um, he's doing fancy. <laughs> he's doing it really fancy. I like to see that. Uh, what he's doing there, let me explain while he's building it. Uh, you can see the 1% chance and the plus 1% coming from bugs. That essentially means that for every bug, that is in uh, currently present in the game, the chance of, of the gate triggering is 1% higher. So if we had 10 bugs in there, the chance would be 11% because of the 1% already present there and adding uh, from, from the different bugs. So the more bugs you have, the higher the chance it is to convert into something useful. Uh, and then the three potential hour points that it comes into design points, technology points, or research points. Yes, that is the outcome where you can get those. If I remember correctly, if I cannot convert into research points, Alex? Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe only design uh, and technology points. Yeah, maybe, okay. maybe only that. Um, so no research. Sorry. That's all right. But, okay. So we've got a random number of bugs. This is going to be attempting to fire every step. Uh, but it has a 4% chance. It just converted one and another one. It just leaves us with a 2% chance. Yeah. Uh, the idea here is that if so, bugs, the way bugs are fixed is pretty standard like with time of course it depends on team size and some of your employees qualities but um the way you have it here it the way we built it right now is there's a possibility that a lot of time goes by and the bugs do not get fixed which is not the case in the game bugs get fixed kind of at a regular basis so if you spend time on it it's pretty guaranteed that you're going to solve bugs. so i would do it I would draw the, the resource out maybe every step, but um, just give it a chance to not convert into anything as well. So send it into a random or a drain or anything, or just not equate the chances into, or yeah, sure, fix, but that works. 
uh, but make the just don't I wouldn't make it based on a chance to happen. It should happen every week. Like every week, you should probably fix a bug for it every couple of weeks. That's... Okay. I would probably change the the percentage down here instead of having it uh, based on is it... whatever it is. I would probably just make it a fifty percent per week to fix a bug. So. Okay. Mm, here we can have kind of problem calls during a week. We fix five bugs. Probably like five or six per week, five or six per week. Yeah. Okay. Then we just, uh, there's an easier approach for this. We drop the 50%. And if we do between five and six, we can do five, no, four plus D2 on the connection here. So every, every week we pull, we pull between five and six bugs and split them across the, the whole. And also, this would come from here. Um, I don't know what you're trying to do on the bottom there. I mean, I trust you. You can do whatever you want. No, I, I don't know what you're doing. Now that we've got this, uh, we don't need it. I was looking at a, a random trigger for a drain to randomly drain the bugs. But if they're yeah. kind of going through deterministically. And if you generate some bugs now. So we get some bugs. Yeah. They get split up into three. Now, these are currently all have the same odds of. Yeah. I think we can leave them at same odds. It's not really if they if you can give us like exact percentages, we can change them. But if not, we can just leave them as equal chances for each of them. So yeah, we're not generating a lot of bugs anyway in the beginning. So it's not really that big of a deal. We're not generating like 30 bugs at the moment. So it's fine, I guess. Uh, yeah, and all of these. Um, go back and convert into a score of the game. Now, on the score part, I admit that I'm going to need your guys' help because I'm a bit lost here. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of variables going around. So uh, I think that the first one we should look at is quality. Um, now, quality, as I get it, is a combination of a lot of factors, a lot of different factors uh i in our model we agreed that we would start with a quality of one um now i'm gonna build something well, a bit a bit above general point matthew just uh, once lev and alex like how did you think about the, the the mechanic of um the mechanic of game quality in game Gear tycoon mm, i think is that during the process of creation of game the player has to choose what to focus on uh, like uh three times what the game should be about it should be more about uh level design or like more about narrative and every topic has its preference and it's pretty tricky to simulate the process of how player chooses want what to focus on and we decided to find the maximum value of a function when the player reaches the high score and the minimum value of a function when the player by his decisions reaches the lowest quality of a game and just take the average between them yeah and it's so. it's it's really interesting because i think that's something that all game designers go through in real life as well right i like had how do you approach that in in your kind of game designs when you're thinking around how much time should you should be putting into your um you know, qu improving quality adding features fixing bugs like how do you how do you approach it alex and Liv? So in our project, it's actually like we don't worry about bugs right now and about optimization. It's because it's like, you know, it's for future us. <laughs> yeah. It's a future Alex but, problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, I think the most important process in our development is iteration. So we were kind of like, we iterate things a lot. Like we iterate a combat system like dozens of times before we find the, like a perfect solution for something like that. We iterate a lot of mechanical prototyping that we prototype them, we like trying them, we play test them. And if we find that's like it's fun, we like we just decided, yeah, this mechanic is fun. We 
uh, we may like leave it as SSB and or we can just like take to improve it a little. So we just iterate a lot. Yeah. I think that's what a lot of um, game designers do, kind of a lot of what we do inside uh, machinations models is kind of helping find the fun, work out like what's going to be interesting for players, uh, what's that going to do. And uh, immediately, even inside this model, we can start to look at you know, what's what's going to be fun for the player, this process of, you know, they get to pick the topic, the genre, the platform, and the audience. And obviously we're creating these as random gates right now, but obviously as a player's experience, they're going to be going through making these choices. And you know, I love this this bug mechanic in the game where at what point do you launch the game? And I think everybody knows in reality when we're going through this, there's always going to be bugs and we're never going to be bug free. Uh, I love this deterministic world inside the game where you can you know, you get to the point of having zero bugs if only there was a little counter that told you really exactly how many bugs there were uh, and you could make a decision like that in 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 game design yeah uh, well, don't say how like they have like a perfect world where you if you spent like uh, some time you fix a bug uh, in real life it's impossible. You always have something like unsolvable, or you just cannot find a problem at all. Yeah. Take so, you know you Wait. fix you fix one bug and it creates another two. Yeah. Mo, how do you think about that type of process of you know uh, iteration processes, finding the fun and bug squashing? Right. So you see, this is this is something I think about a lot. Um, it's very easy for studios to you know what usually happens is in you know pre-production the team is small you know during production the game scales and in the last few months right you have like the content furnace that you have to keep a light and you know you really massively scale the team so that you can build enough content for launch uh, at that point you found the fun uh, you know you build the challenge and now you're scaling it through more content um, and at this point, this is where like a lot of QA starts. And I think that's, that's absolutely wrong. I think that, you know, uh, QA is something that should be done at the start of the process, um, not just in terms of, you know, squashing bugs, but also in terms of understanding, you know, player flow, you know, are you delivering on the fantasy? Uh, are you delivering on the the experience uh, that the player should have, you know, working through the core mechanic or, or the core loop? Uh, are rewards uh, at an early stage sufficient? Is the challenge scaling well uh, during, you know, the, the early levels? So these are, these are things that I think, um, you know, are important to, to nail early. You know, we talk about finding the fun early, building that core loop out, and I think that, you know, that's one part of the process. The other part is, you know, polishing from day one. And it's easier said than done. Uh, but I think the games that really get it right are those that, you know, they have, you know, QA from the start. Uh, they have the devs playing the game. So just finding this balance between, you know, the devs playing the game all the time and, you know, the professional aspect of, of QA and, and the, the importance of that work there from the very beginning to not just squash bugs, but to to give feedback on the experience as a whole, uh, I think is important. And uh, you know, obviously, undeniably, that work you know is is super crucial in that home stretch, right? When you're when you're on that content treadmill uh, and you have those those bugs to squash, and um, and that's when you know if you've done you know the first part right you know, you have a solid understanding and a solid process set in place so that when you hit that treadmill, you know exactly, you know, you know that bugs are going to come up, but you know exactly, you're, pre you're prepared for it. So it's, it's a much, it's a much uh, better process, but it requires some investment in the early stage. And I, you know, I believe that's, that's a, a sound philosophy in theory, harder in applications, but those that get it right, really, it, it does pay off. Yeah. Lev, like what, what advice would you have for anybody going through that and getting ready yeah. for that sort of process? I totally agree with the previous speakers and I would like to adjust that it's very important to start show 
your game as early as possible. Maybe not to the QA team if you haven't enough budget for it, but like for your friends, for your family, because you as a dev can be kind of with a closed eyes and you cannot see some things which will be uh, uh, shown for the players. And we are think that many tycoons nowadays, indie tycoons, kind of boring in the core loop and it's essential uh, to find this game feel, this juicy, which should be attract uh, people. Like in, uh, if we speak about Game Dev Tycoon, these attack points and design points are little bubbles which fly uh, when, you create, when, you, when you're creating a game. And this is uh, this juice of a game which uh, gives fun for players. And every new game, every new creation is a research, which is uh, pretty fun for a player because he's, uh, we're trying to find the best approach. We're trying to create the best game. And I guess the only way the Game Dev Tycoon team uh, did it was the iteration process when we, we gave a game to players and we played it. Yeah. No, absolutely. Alex, anything you'd add on to that? So, uh, I just want to agree with Mohammed because this is, uh, uh, in our project, uh, the QA and early stage development, they basically play the game and try to find if it's fun. So, so they don't look at bugs a lot because we have bugs. We, and they are multiplied because we're in like, the a, a process of develop, early development. Yeah, some kind of like a process of production. It's unavoidable to have bugs. But on early stages, when we kind of try to define a core loop of a lot of, a lot of game models, they play, uh, they, uh, they play a lot of the, uh, they play a lot and they try to find if something is, feels fun, feels correct, it's challenging. So I completely agree with Mohammed at this. Excellent. Uh, I, uh, I always enjoy a lot of the models that we've built. Um, once we've once we've gone through and kind of started this process of actually sitting down with the machinations model, hitting play, and up using the interactive elements of it to kind of um, almost play through the game and like role play playing the game using machinations, um, you know, hitting the roll and going, oh, I got a lot of bugs that time, uh, or a small number of bugs. You get that same sort of excitement um, from from the machinations models, just playing it as you can from uh, once the game and all the beautiful graphics have been added. Nice. So, what are we going to build next, Chazal? What was the next um, systems? Uh, I think I wanted to touch upon quality, and I wanted to touch upon a specific part of quality. If you would scroll a bit above where general points were okay where i have the pool there you can also stop the execution so it's not uh grayed out um we're gonna be doing uh, quality which is going to be a coefficient now quality is we will start with it at one and it can increase or decrease by 0.1 now this is something i want to highlight when using machinations uh, which is how do we deal with decimal numbers? Uh, because pools only store entire resources. There's no way to split a resource into multiple fractions or anything. You either transfer entire resource or, or you transfer nothing. Um, and because our quality is a decimal number, the way I, I handle it in machinations is I will have the quality pool, which I will uh, start with in which I will start with 10 resources and I will have my register, which will be the actual quality and uh, just gonna send it as a variable and divide it by 10. So whenever I add or deduct point one quality, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna add or deduct one resource into the quality pool and it's gonna be in one or point one into the, uh, it's gonna mean plus point one or minus point one into the, into the quality register. And the register is the one that I'm gonna use for the formulas uh, further. So this is one way to, to use um, such a decimal number is 
converting it into a higher number and uh, doing the math inside the register because the register can hold fractional values. So it's, it's fine to do so. Um, I'm also going to add a source and a drain here because depending on uh, different outcomes, you can either gain quality or lose quality. Uh, they're going to be as one on the resource connections because, uh, as I said, it's an increase of 0.1 or decrease of 0.1. Um, the quality, is, the increase or decrease is based on the formula again, and the formula is uh, it only comes into play when you have more than 30 general points. So it's not really applicable for us in the beginning of the game where we have 21, but um, it basically looks at design points and technology points. Now the formula, I'm not really sure why it's built that way. Maybe Lev can explain to us why it's built that way while I type it in, but uh, it basically looks at design points and technology points and the difference between the two. That's kind of what in in short what it does so and then why gonna... uh, probably the expression looks at the difference between tech points uh, it tries to find the range between tech points and design points you know when in in even in real life you focus too much on development you may forgot about uh, game design and the game will be kind of but <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and again if you focus too much on game design you may forget about uh, tech tech aspect and the game will be bad yeah i think they maybe try to justify like you know uh, uh stats uh, of ch uh, of uh, characters of your employers because if you create your team too much to one-sided they, it will be like bad for your game. I think they kind of like try to justify, uh, you know, uh, for you to have like a design spec specialist and technology specialist in your team at the same time in a later game. Like we don't uh, look at this right now because we like this set of ditches, but in the late game, it's quite important. Yes. And uh, the formula, Matthew, if you can zoom down a bit, um, is uh, basically looking at, uh, you can see it on the right of the pools. Uh, that's the one. Uh, it's looking at design points, multiplies it by 0.5, deducts the technology points and divided by the maximum between the two. Now that is, uh, that should be an absolute value. So I'm also going to add an absolute in here just to get that positive number. And uh, based on the results here, you already see some in there. Um, now it's not looking pretty, but you can see that it's above 0.5 at the moment in that example. Uh, there are some rules in which the quality increases or decreases. So basically if uh, the value from here, um, I'm just going to point it like so. So if the value in here is less than, uh, less or equal than 0.25, then um, a point of uh, point 0.1 quality is added. And if it's higher than 0.5, then quality is deducted. So should be something like this. Uh, you can see the nodes that are around quality, the source and the drain are set to on enable as a, as a trigger. That is because uh, if the, so you can see what, what the scenario was here where we got above 0.5. So we set them to on enabling because if the condition is met, we only want the action to be performed once. So it does not keep the ducting quality. So we set them to on enable. So when the condition becomes true, the, the node performs their action, then becomes uh, passive again. So these are the scenarios. Now it's pretty, I've done some testing with this as well. It's kind of like equal chances for either outcome. So it's, uh, you're gonna see each, each of the, each of the, the possibilities come into play. Uh, great, that's the quality. 
uh, again, one important mention, you need to have over 30 general points. Now, I did not implement it here because I somehow have the feeling that we're not going to be playing so much as to get to 30 general points. So I'll just leave it from the start in there. Um, but as an added condition, it would mean that you would also have to look at general points and only allow this increase or decrease to happen if the general points are above 30 or equal. Um, and I think with this, we can get into score. I'm pretty sure we can get into score. Um, again, the score is a formula that takes kind of uses every other register that we built so far. So this is kind of what we've uh, been preparing for. I'm not sure where to build it, Matthew. I think I'll leave the decision in your place where you want to place a register in here that is the nice, score. a nice cap down the bottom here. Yeah, sure. Keep in mind that we'll have to drag connections from all over the model into it. So uh, yeah, we're going to have a score. It's going to be based on a lot of things, general points, quality, uh, the platform and genre combination, the target audience, the bugs, so uh, all that. Now, there is a variable in here, and maybe you guys can explain it to me, that stands for bugs, which is BR, but I'm not sure what it represents. I guess it represents bugs result or something. If any of you, like in the score, there is something that's related to bugs, but I don't think it's the bugs that there are currently in the game. I think that there's... Yeah, actually... it's uh, the total number of bugs which appeared during the creation of the game. So mm -hmm. it's like uh, a random number which we created. Yeah, but if the bugs are fixed, then... That... No, uh, like, uh, <laughs> let's say that it's the initial uh, value of bugs. Okay, initial value of bugs. Okay. Okay, okay. Then we need to also uh, store this in a different place, Matthew. The the bugs in there. I'm on you're it. All, you're already on it, yeah. I can see. I'm curious to what you're gonna do. I see how it is. That's a that's a very good approach. So Matthew is basically constructing a different source with a, a pool. And um, he's using the bugs pool from above to generate resources into the one on the bottom. The reason we are doing this, and when you when you generate bugs, Matthew, they're going to get it instantly, is uh, because, as you see, we are losing the bugs because we are fixing them. So we need to keep count of them somewhere. So we are using the, the source at the bottom to track how many bugs we have. Again, this comes into the total score formula. So it's uh, relevant for us now. I'm going to start typing the total score formula, and then we're going to come back and drag the connections from all over the place just to see how uh, intertwined the all of the different uh, parameters can be. Uh, I'm going to start typing here while Matthew, I think, already started dragging some connections around. Is it one from each of the different registers? Oh, I, I can drag them. It's fine. Uh, not really all of them. Uh, let me just so we need we need general points uh bugs i'm gonna name br we need general points we need quality uh, we need platform and genre which is this one i'm gonna name it to pg we need a target audience which is the one from here. This is going to be TA. Uh, quality. Uh, Raw quality in with the label Q. Yeah, quite, uh, yeah, capital Q, it's fine. And uh, BR and we also need the general points, which I'm going to drag right now from here. Let me move the source and name this uh, GP. And you can see the formula is basically GP divided by two. So general points divided by two, and then we multiply every other thing. So we multiply the quality, we multiply the platform and genre modifier, the target audience modifier and the bugs. Uh, platform and genre and target audience are always gonna be either one or 
below one, so they don't add a lot of multiplying. Quality is always around one, so it's not going to add a lot. Um, they do influence the score, and also the bots and the GP are going to. So now, Matthew, if we are to hit play, maybe, and see how the score handles. Excuse uh, me. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Uh, excuse me for interrupting you, but we have one miss that's not the bugs is my miss are uh, adding to the quality but there is a special uh coefficient which is calculated from the initial bugs and is added to the quality and what, what does this so it's calculated from the initial bugs yeah it's and like added to the quality yeah and how does that transition into i mean how do how do initial bugs transition into quality mm, they uh, they don't like the bugs are converted into a special coefficient which is added into the quality okay uh is there a ratio at which they are converted uh, are they like if i were to drag register here and have the bugs this game yeah probably like we have to oh it's like one more long expression but okay uh let's type it uh we have to uh one uh, one minus uh okay, i'm typing it yes yes i am you ah. can't see the change until i hit enter but yeah yeah okay like uh one minus uh uh, points eight um, of uh, like okay, Alex, can you help me with this expression? I you can maybe you can even type it in the chat if you want, and I can pick ah, it up. But... Yeah, okay, yeah, it's... just type it in the chat. Yeah, a really long one. <laughs> okay, uh... I get it. Uh, disclaimer for the people watching: there's a lot of formulas in here, like and. Ah, I see. I see it. I see it. I think I have it. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. The one with 0.8 multiplying number of bugs, 0.100 divided by GP. Okay, okay, I see it. Okay, okay, I see. It. Um, so it should come from number of bugs. Yeah, I'll type it in. So. While I type it in, maybe Matthew can provide some commentary. Or... Well, actually, I was going to uh, pull Mo into this and see, you know, I like it. How, how what, what Mo's commentary would be. Yeah. Right. Um, see, here's here's the thing about this this diagram and this game is that I'm I'm honestly like learning. I've never played Game Dev Tycoon, and um, it's it's very interesting, but I I genuinely don't have a commentary on this. <laughs> well, well, I, I, let me, let me, I, I threw you under the bus then. So I think one of the things I find really interesting actually about this conversation is we can. It's like the meta of the meta. It's like um, Inception because we're talking about game design while talking about the game game design or or game game dev tycoon. It's like the meta of the meta. Um, so it's just really interesting to be able to kind of look at not only uh, the game design process for a game like this, but actually the game theory that they're talking about in here. So you know, when we when we launch games, and we were talking about bugs a moment ago, um, you know, you can never launch a game that has no bugs. Um, in fact, I think the the definition would probably be if you if you manage to launch a game without any bugs, it probably means you haven't tested it enough yet, um, which is kind of a good a good rule of thumb for it. But uh, yeah, I've I've written the formula. It's, uh, uh, I can save you. Uh, okay. No, yeah. I, mean, I I could carry on talking for another ten minutes. No, you are doing great. Uh, so B stands for the, the number of bugs that we had in the game, and GP is, again, general points. This is the formula that gives us a, a coefficient. Um, now, this is the one that goes into the score, am I correct? Yeah. Okay. So this uh, register here, I'm going to drag the BR from bugs this game, going to drag it all the way. Uh, 
into the coefficient here, then this is going to be our BF. Uh, so this is going to be our total score. Matthew, right now, if we were to hit play and generate all of the different genres and all of the different. Uh... And so if I hit play, yeah. we're going to automatically kind of set our quality score. Um, yeah, th that is bugs. Sorry, that is something that we should have um, maybe done only when the player chooses all four of them then that becomes available but again it's not important since we only do it once we can assume that we do it before the others so it's not really important it's still going to add into the the map so that quickly moves some of these so we got a, a one a 0 0.9 and a 0 0.6 uh we got can you zoom in yeah sure uh, so we've got a one for our topic genre score 0 0.9 for our genre platform and 0.6 for target audience yeah target audience uh we had four bugs and we've managed to clear all those bugs we've got a 0.5 here uh, we've got a quality of 10. yeah the, uh, that doesn't change our quality it needs to be above 0.5 so it's not so our um, score is 48.06 close to yeah that's our game score uh is that kind of relevant with what you're getting in the game uh, probably not because again this is total score which isn't ah. shown to the player and it will be converted into a score which is gonna be uh showed. Yeah, yeah, the, the score that they get for the game release. Yeah. Um okay, we did we calculated this score. This score is then used for something that I see is called here as a target score. We have target score, we have target game score, and we have target score delta, which is uh, a lot of fun because uh, they're pretty close uh, to each other in naming. And uh, we kind of need this, especially the target game score we need because this is the one that gets uh, converted into the first review score. So when a game is released, um, after a month, I believe, or something like that, uh, reviews come back and usually get four different reviews pretty close to each other and according to those reviews which can be between one and ten or i think between i don't know if i've ever managed to get the one actually it's I, it's maybe possible to get the one and according to those reviews it's probably the way that you generate cash uh, according to reviews and fans and yeah so we're gonna use that uh we're gonna use our score in some of the math here now we need the target game score our target target game score comes from target score and target score delta so a lot of, of intertwined uh, system here i'm just going to place another register below total score i'm going to name it target game score uh, and uh, this is going to be adding a bunch of different factors so i first need those factors so we're going to have a target score in here this is basically an, an in-depth look into the into the game system so for those of you that have played game tycoon now you know exactly what you need to do to to be successful at the game no more guessing so uh you know exactly what to aim for i know i i learned something from this and i'll probably my next playthrough will be a lot better than my first one um yeah so we have target game score target score and target score delta um now the target game score i see here that it's based on other parameters and if uh, you don't have a target score it's automatically set to 20. um if i understood correctly it's something that when you build a game in a certain genre you get a, a score for that game that becomes kind of your target score and you for the next game you kind of compare yourself to that the previous one that you released am i correct something like that yeah you're yeah. absolutely correct yeah and if you don't so if it's your first game in that genre that target game score is 20 because you obviously don't have a previously released game so it's yeah uh, because we only have 10 minutes left I'm just going to do target game score as a 20, just assume that this is our first game that we release, which is kind of true for our simulation here. Um, normally, if you would um, want to keep track of target game score, you would probably also need 
to check which type of, of games you've developed so far. So when you develop a certain type of game, let's say RPG, you will have a certain pool somewhere in which you keep that information that I have developed one RPG game before. So you can access that score and check it. When you build your second one, you can check what your previous score is and what you're basically up against. Uh, now that I have it as 20, this, this, make life, this makes uh, life a bit easier. Uh, target score, again, is something that uh, is set maybe. Uh, but as I seen here, target score is basically the, the score that we calculated earlier. So uh, if I'm looking at total score here, this is kind of, I don't know if I'm guessing this correctly or not, if this is what I'm getting, but as I see, it, that's kind of the one or not. Everything okay. is okay. You're correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That uh, that reassures me. Um, I'm just gonna name this. Yes, just to keep consistent with the formula that I'm seeing, so I don't make a mess out of them. Uh, yeah. So now we're in general total score. We're gonna have the the target score as well, and uh, we're gonna have our uh, first review score. Let's just build this one over here, just so I can show you. Because the first review score uses the target game score, which we have as a 20 right now. So we don't really need the other variables. And it uses the, the, the score that we generated earlier. So we're going to have uh, two connections coming from uh, those two registers. I'm going to name the top one PS. I'm going to name the bottom one EGS. And um, this is going to be the review score. So the score that the player will receive. Now, I hope I'm going to translate this formula properly in here. Let's see. It's again a bit complicated. Uh, and want to make sure that I don't forget any, any number in here. So it's 10 multiplied by the score divided by target. You multiply that by nine and divided by 10. So you basically multiply by 0.9. Uh, so that's gonna be uh, the score. Now, again, a rule here that I see is that if the number, because if you get weird numbers, it can probably go below zero. It can probably go above 10. Uh, the idea here is that if the number is less than zero, you should show a zero. If the number is higher than 10, you should show a 10. You shouldn't go above. So what we need to do in here is actually have a minimum and a maximum that uh, include each other. So minimum means that if I do it like so and stick a 10 in here, it means that it's going to uh, display the minimum value between the two. So if the, the formula on the left is less than 10, it's going to display that. If the formula on the left is higher than 10, then it's going to display the 10. So that's one. And the other one for the zero is I'm going to add a maximum before the minimum. So if that whole uh, uh, portion in there is higher than zero, it's going to display that. If not, then it's going to display zero. So this is going to be the, the review score. And Matthew, for the grand finale, I think we can just make our own interactive game now and see what score we get with. Uh, what we have here, just as a as a preview, uh, just to show. Okay, so Obviously, this, a... this should be maybe automated in a way where you create games automatically over time and unlock new technologies. But this is just to show how the different systems interact with each other and why each individual decision that you take when developing a game is important and relevant for the final score of the game. Yeah, so this is where we've got an adventure game dungeon. Uh, we're going to go on PC, young audience, let's generate some bugs, fix our bugs. So we've got total bugs, we've got our quality score, and that's then going to give us a total score of 75, target game score of 20, and a review score of 10. Oh, amazing score. Woo, we win this.
Yay. So what are the the kind of the key things when you, when you were looking into this eleven Alex? Like what were the things that you saw inside the machina um, in Game Dev Tycoon that uh, kind of um, kind of caught your interest? Is there any is it the, obviously the gameplay style certainly does appeal to game developers. So is that what um, kind of originally drew you to it, or is there anything? Um, in particular about the mechanics you enjoy, Alex? Uh, for me, uh, the game Death Tech One is pretty, it's okay, it's uh, it's very simple, but it's good representation uh, of the like uh, processes when you're making a game. Uh, yes, they kind of like decide to teach like, you know, uh, all creative process because in real life you cannot just like, you know, choose the action and choose a topic and, you know, audience and uh, platform and create a game just just from the top but i think it's very good simplified but pretty good uh, you know representation of the process it's uh give a player like a feeling like that they kind of like are managing their own studio without having them with a plan you know uh basically a routine like you know every profession has a their own routine and they kind of like decide to, you know, throw all unfun things from the game development and just to live like, you know, uh, simplified incremental version of the game studio. So I think they, they create a pretty cool experience for like, you know, for the player. It's simple. Uh, it's, uh, uh, if you remember, uh, you know, uh, the Japanese studio Kairosoft, they have like the very popular, game game the story they have they have a very similar mechanics it's even more simple i think uh and they uh, they bought like game the story and game the tycoon they were very very popular because they very simple they very approachable for players and they give the feeling that you're managing your own studio i think they do, do this uh, and right nice but i think you want to want to add to this no, I think this has just been really interesting for me because like I said, I, I haven't played the game. And so I'm sort of like looking at these systems and trying to understand, you know, um, you know, obviously this is very meta. It doesn't have the progression and the unlocking, but it's just very interesting to see, you know, how uh, the different genres and topics, uh, you know, fall into one register, uh, whereas you have, your uh, your sort of platform fall into a separate register and your audience in, in a third one. Uh, it, it's just very interesting to see how they, they break these into, into three different parts and mixing uh, topic and genre together, seeing how the bugs play out and how that increases your scores uh, and, or, or points for, for design and tech uh, and how you have all these intricate uh, layers to bugs and and bug calculations and coefficients and and then from there you know the how the score of the of the game gets judged and and the quality it's very interesting to see the quality related to bugs i wanted to ask in the in the actual game death tycoon i know this is very meta but in, in the actual game itself is the quality score directly linked to the bugs or is there other elements that affect the quality score no, this is probably a true uh, metal game and all expressions uh, from the game Dev Tycoon uh, fandom, thanks them. <laughs> and yes, this is how the game works. Uh, as for me, I especially did the team system in the game. We didn't cover it, but it really feels like in real life when you have to understand that every team member is a person and from time to time they want to uh, relax they want to not to do the games and moreover it uh, but the game says that you have to balance between tech and design and not uh, to be you can be mastering something but you shouldn't forget about the other side in order to achieve the best value you can Yes, I, I like it. Yeah, no, this is this has been super interesting. You know, now, now I'm actually excited to to try the game. 
but you know I can't add any any commentary on something I haven't played and uh, it's just the abstraction seems really cool and it's enticed me to actually give it a go one day I think the next thing that we would do with a model like this is obviously we've just kind of built up the logic we'd probably add a player loop there somewhere do you think Chizza? and look at a kind of a, a reset mechanism mechanism and progression for this so yeah. that you would then track the the first game go to its production reset the board and then go into the next game's production using those different progressions yeah systems. we would also have to include the revenue in there because yeah games cost money to make they give money to the player we should also add fans which we haven't touched upon but again this is something that uh, can be added so th there's a bunch of this is not representative of the entire game is in any way it's jo just a small fraction of it so uh, the game is way more not way more complex but it is more complex than uh, what we see here and there are several other factors that are really important in the economy excellent so mo what have we got coming up next so actually we have uh, our webinar coming up uh next thursday actually so that that should be super fun uh, we're talking about the metaverse right we we've been talking a lot about it we've been hearing a lot about it and uh, we're, we're not really sure what the full potential of that could be and how you know that affects game design and where a tool like machination stands uh in in you know the the wide spectrum of of tools in the metaverse and uh, that supported in terms of, you know, content creation. So we're excited. We have a really nice and diverse panel to, to, to discuss, you know, from, you know, people that are directly in development of games to people that are, you know, tangentially in the games industry working on, uh, you know, most important things in terms of streaming and, and capturing live moments to investors in the, in, in the space. And so, uh, you know, capturing you know, this wide spectrum in, the, in a panel, we obviously have our, our co-founder and CEO and myself, you know, I think it's going to be very interesting to tackle the metaverse from all these different angles. So it should be very exciting. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I look forward to that one for sure. Excellent. Lev and Alex, what are you guys working on now? What can we next uh, look forward to see from your developments? Anything you can talk about? Unfortunately, I can't talk about anything right now. <laughs> so. so stay tuned for more exciting developments and games coming out soon. Excellent. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, I'm sorry too, because I have like NDA. So I can't talk, um, uh, I can't talk about it, like, no, I would game a lot, but, uh, you know, uh, I hope we'll be released in 2022 and see you in our game next year. Um, and if you want to know what is it, you can always like a Google a trailer from Ifri and look at this and have like something like early passion about how it will be and how it will play. Fantastic. Well, we'll certainly look forward to that in 2022. Thank you. So amazingly, it's only a couple of months away now. Uh, so I hope that the game development goes very well. Well, 2022 is kind of like, you know, it's still 12 months. Look, look, we'll, we'll keep tuned and see when that comes out. Anything else to wrap us up, Mike? I think we're good. We wanted to thank, obviously, GD Cuffs for, you know, joining us today and then this great collaboration and hopefully the first of many to come and in different forms as well uh so I, I look forward to exploring you know the opportunities between gd cuffs and machinations further uh obviously wanted to thank you know everyone who tuned in today and joined us and obviously Cesar and matthew for the amazing work crafting you know this deconstruction of game dev tycoon so thank you everyone and uh, stay tuned we have a lot of interesting things coming up if you haven't signed up for the metaverse webinar uh you know go do that that's not one to miss and uh, you know, join our Discord. Uh, I, I think we've posted the link on the on the chat. If you join our Discord, there's a lot of discussion going on there related to game design. 
And that, that's where you can stay tuned for all the stuff we have coming up and, and you know, machinations where we're working hard and, and we have a lot of uh, really cool initiatives. So uh, join us there and stay tuned for those.